as well as our those watching online, and, and thank you for supporting local history programming at the library. Before introducing our speaker, I want to briefly mention two upcoming programs. On uh, Sunday, June 11th, baseball historian Larry Lester will be here to discuss the Kansas City Monarchs and how they became one of the most famous and successful teams in baseball's Negro Leagues and their lasting legacy. Then on June 2nd, our speaker is local historian Michael Sweeney. Michael will discuss his in-depth research of legendary pitmaster Henry Perry, who is widely regarded as the father of Kansas City Barbecue. So our next three Sunday programs, beginning with today's program, feature the three Bs, booze, baseball, and barbecue. <laughs> or, or what I call summer in Kansas City. <laughs> that today's program is co-presented by the Historic West Bottoms Association in conjunction with its eighth annual Heritage Days celebration. Uh, we are proud to be an ongoing partner in this annual event by, by hosting programs like this that spotlight the rich and diverse history of the West Bottoms. At this time, I'll invite uh, Historic, Historic West Bottoms President Tom Esselman up to say a few words about Heritage Days. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for taking time out of this absolutely gorgeous Sunday to be here. Um, and it's going to be well worth it. Um, celebrating the history and legacy of Kansas City at large, but also just some of the unique aspects of Kansas City is something that, you know, those of us who have been here well, I've been here 33 years. Some of you maybe have been here one year or less than one year. It doesn't matter. There's some uniqueness that right now we have a lot to be grateful for about things that, uh, that tie us together as Kansas Cityans. And uh, Historic West Bottoms is one of those places. Um, about 120 some odd years ago, n over 95% of the economic wealth of the city existed in the West Bottoms. Now, it was a bunch of cows and pigs, don't get me wrong, but uh, all the stores, all the hotels, all the restaurants, all the commerce really started in the West Bottoms of Kansas City, and then it grew from out of that. Um, what, uh, what you need to know about the West Bottoms is right now it's going through a massive transformation. Uh, it is probably the last vestige of kind of commercial real estate that hasn't really been developed in and expanded the way uh, places like maybe downtown, like the Sprint Center, now the T-Mobile Center, and Crossroads. When I came here 32 years ago, I came to work for Hallmark Cards, 1987, and after 5 p.m., raise your hand, you could see the tumbleweed blowing through the streets after 5 p.m., right? But now things are different. And, uh, and the West Bottoms may be the next crossroads in terms of the types of development. But for a development of the West Bottoms to happen without recognition and preservation of things that make it so historic and so much a part of what we are would be wrong. So we are all about innovation, but we're, innovation, we're about innovation with a balance toward recognizing our historical legacy. And if you know anything about Hallmark, where I worked for 25 years, it's a company that's been around since 1910. It taught me a lot about the importance of what it means to be part of Kansas City, what it means also to be innovative and sustainable. I was actually, during one of my jobs at Hallmark, in charge of innovation for greeting cards. <laughs> that might seem like a, a bit of a paradox, uh, but I was the, I, the guy that came up with the idea, what, what if we put songs into greeting cards? So we made these music cards, right? And you open them up and you hear, I Will Survive by Gloria Gaynor, or What a Wonderful <laughs> World by Louis Armstrong. And there was a real emotional connection there that somehow you couldn't get with just ink on paper, even though the finance guys hated me for putting you know, batteries and, <laughs> and speakers. Um, the point is, you have to... Be willing to do some things that are different and that people are going to fight against if you want to change and if you want to innovate. And today we're here to celebrate uh, whiskey distilling 
in the West Bottoms, Alex Lindsay and his family, they're innovators. Um, they're focused a lot on what makes whiskey distilling, you know, so, such a historical legacy. But you'll also notice in the first instance, they're all about what's new and different. And the fact that they're located in the West Bottoms, I think, is a perfect mix. So, uh, so I think you're going to hear a lot of interesting things. By the way, why whiskey in the West Bottoms? Those of you who may not know, uh, there was something in American history called Prohibition when alcohol was pretty much not allowed, except if you lived in Missouri. And if you lived in Kansas and needed alcohol, you would come to 9th Street in the West Bottoms because it was really close to the Kansas border. And on 9th Street, there were, uh, back in the early 1900s, there were about 29 buildings. 27 of them were either bars or liquor stores. <laughs> uh, yesterday we celebrated something called the Wettest Block Party, uh, and a beautifully restored bar at Ninth and State uh, was celebrating some of that historical legacy. And um, in fact, they featured some of the West Bottoms whiskey from Alex Lindsay and his family. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of context about why um, why I'm so. Uh, glad to be part of Kansas City and why I'm glad to be um, involved in the West Bottoms because as a parent, I have four kids, they're all married, they have their own kids. Like I said, we, they grew up here in Kansas City and I want them to know why I love Kansas City as much as anything and as they discover places like the West Bottoms, which many people are just now discovering for the first time, I want them to be imbued with the sense that while it has a lot of old time historical legacy, it has tons of innovation. And it's about what's new and different and what's, what's, what's the promise for um, Kansas City going forward. So I hope that you think about that theme as you hear from Alex and, and we hear about the history of distilling in, in Kansas City. So thanks for being here and I hope you have a great, a great event today. I'm back. <laughs> I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker this afternoon, Alex Lindsay. Alex is founder of the West Bottoms Whiskey Company and the master distiller of its award winning Kansas City whiskey. Uh, uh, he is a native Kansas Cityan who resides in Columbus Park with his partner Cassandra and their daughter Lex. Lindsay loves history and he loves to tinker. Those two passions inspire and drive his whiskey making. In his 20s, Alex started distilling as a hobby using a 10 gallon copper Alembic pot. Uh, this turned into a full-time job when he opened his own distillery in 2021. He chose the West Bottoms location because of its legacy of industry and innovation, not to mention its boozy past. When <laughs> Dozens of saloons serve locally produced spirits uh, to workers from nearby stockyards and packing houses. Uh, Lindsay has received accolades for his signature Kansas City whiskey. In 2021, it earned a double gold medal designation at the Denver International Spirits Competition, placing in the top 3% of American blended whiskeys. He was kind enough to bring samples for us to enjoy following the program. Um, but for now, let's, uh, before we enjoy the whiskey, let's enjoy a presentation on whiskey and distilling. Uh, please join me in welcoming Alex Lindsay.
Uh, again, my name is Alex Lindsay. Uh, my partner Cassandra, daughter Lex, are here. Um, we were both very happy. Uh, Cassandra, by the way, is our operations manager. Uh, if you really want to get anything done there, uh, she's the person to talk to. Um, and uh, our daughter Lex there, uh, who is uh, a bundle of joy and hopefully will sit still for most of the presentation. <laughs> um, so the West Bottoms in general, uh, I want to kind of give a little scope here. Um, I'm going to reference this quote from uh, a book that I really love. Uh, the book is uh, American Gods by Neil Gaiman. Um, there is uh, there is a section where uh, basically the god Odin is among us uh, today. He is traveling with a companion, and they're heading to a place called House on the Rock uh, up in Wisconsin, I believe it is. Um, it is a strange house. Uh, it was built by a strange man, and it is filled with just strange things that people gravitate towards. Some people call it tourist traps, uh, more or less. But in the conversation in the car. Uh, I love this quote um, by Odin in this sense. In other countries over the years, people recognize this as a place of the power. Uh, sometimes it would be a natural formation, sometimes it would just be a place that was somehow special. Uh, they knew that something important was happening there, that there was some focusing point, some channel, some window to the imminent, and so they would build temples or cathedrals or erect stone circles or well, so you get the idea. Um, which is pretty fascinating, and, and there is something to that um, with the West Bottoms. Um, when you guys walk down, about the West Bottoms, I'm going to talk about whiskey, because uh, that is also a passion of mine. Um, whiskey in America, um, a lot of people may not be familiar with how it started, um, why uh, American whiskey is so different uh, than whiskeys around the world. Um, whiskeys in America, like when you say whiskey around uh, the rest of the world, it means something completely different than it does here in America. Um, we're very uh, special that way, and we like to think that we're special that way too. Um, Distilling in America started uh, a long, long time ago, uh, early early 1700s. Um, Scottish and Irish immigrants started migrating over uh, to the United States to the British colonies at that time. Uh, at which point that they started, uh, I mean, historically they, they drank a lot of rum. Um, you had Caribbean, you know, <clears throat> provinces as well, and rum was a big thing. But once you started getting Scottish and, and Irish immigrants over to the uh, United States or the uh, the British colonies, I should say. Um, that's when they started, you know, harvesting all that grain. Uh, there's a ton of land. Uh, there's a ton of land to farm. Uh, they started uh, basically having an abundance of rye. Uh, and what do you do with rye? Um, because it's going to go bad eventually, um, you can ferment it and distill it. Uh, and that's essentially what the farmers were doing for centuries. Um, with distillation, and if you're not familiar, it's, it's worth kind of pointing out because I think it's fascinating. Um, a lot of people may not know the, the process. Uh, it's obviously started as something like this. Uh, but it has moved on to beautiful, uh, complex stills. Uh, the fundamentals of, of distillation are all the same, though. Um, really starts with uh, your base. Uh, any whiskey is made with a base of a grain. So if you took rye or corn or wheat or barley or something like that, um, you basically add hot water to that. And that hot water bath uh, basically pulls all the sugars and proteins out of that grain and collect it into something called wort, W-O-R-T. Uh, wort is just sticky, syrupy, uh, malty, Goodness. Uh, but what it is, it's liquid that has a ton of sugar in it. Um, with the addition of yeast, that kicks off the fermentation process. Uh, the fermentation process is where basically uh, the yeast eats that sugar, converts it into CO2, and that's where you get carbonation and bubbles. Uh, but it also converts it into alcohol. Um, so after you've basically got a, a vat of beer, uh, the only difference being there's no hops. Hops require beer. Uh, this just, we just want the, the alcohol essentially. Uh, then you throw that into a still. Uh, Still, you basically have to have some enclosed structure, uh, and you have to have a heat source. Um, distillation really happens uh, when you take that, that beer, essentially, you start heating it up. Uh, alcohol or water has a boiling point of 212 degrees Fahrenheit. That's when you start, that's where steam is generated, right? Um, alcohol boils off at a lower temperature. Uh, so at 160, 170 degrees, uh, the vapor or steam that you see coming off of that liquid is actually just alcohol vapor. Um, so what you're trying to do with a still is really just capture that vapor and then condense it back down. So that vapor will go up through a gooseneck, or go through a long tube, or go through many other contraptions. Uh, in the old days, uh, it was basically something just like this. Uh, that uh, steam or vapor would go down into what is called a condenser. Um, so you're basically funneling it, you're pushing this, this alcohol vapor through these uh, coils. And they're wrapping around. And what you do with those coils is you pour cold water over them constantly. So when you have hot vapor hits the cold coil, converts into liquid, uh, and comes out as a uh, much higher proof, much, much higher proof 
uh, just straight white whiskey at that point. Um, a lot of people don't know, all whiskey starts out uh, clear, uh, and that is, that is all distillation, all spirits. Um, what makes it whiskey is the, uh, the touching of a barrel, and that's all it has to do. Uh, in order to call it whiskey, it's, it's got to just touch a barrel, essentially, um, <clears throat> which is pretty fascinating. Um, a lot of farmers have this. Um, a lot of farmers uh, use these. Um, you know, when I, I made reference to uh, grain being, you know, having an abundance of grain, um, if you were a farmer and you sold to the city or to other people, but you still had a lot left, that grain's gonna go bad. That's, that's, you need to do something with it. So you ferment it and you distill it. And once you distill it, and you have essentially whiskey, um, it doesn't go bad. Uh, at that point, you have something that you can trade, that you can barter, that you can sell, um, expand on. Um, and that was a big part of the fabric uh, of, of farmers in America up until 1791, um, where uh, we basically had uh, what was called the Whiskey Rebellion. There, get this, there we go. Um, if, are you guys familiar with the Whiskey Rebellion a little bit? A short period of time. Uh, so obviously, uh, at this point, we are uh, we would be the, uh, the the colonies at this point, the United States. Uh, so this was after the Revolutionary War. Uh, Alexander Hamilton, um, the very popular musical, but also um, <laughs> a very key, key, uh, key person in American history, uh, especially for our financial system uh, that's set up, um, he enacted uh, what was the whiskey tax at that point. Um, as you can imagine, as a farmer, uh, growing all your crops that you worked so hard for, uh, distilling uh, what you could so you could hang on to it or just drink it at home so you could sleep better. There was no air conditioning back then, so I'm sure it was hard. Um, <laughs> Uh, but that was a that 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 really really uh, honestly it pissed them off. Uh, it pissed them off enough uh, to where they uh, basically formed their own band. Uh, that is a uh, flag from one of the militias, um, primarily out of Western Pennsylvania, where it was uh, they called that the West back then. Uh, the West was basically Pennsylvania at this point. Um, it was a it was a a very uh, there's a great book just called The Whiskey Rebellion um, that describes what it was like to live in that area. I mean, you were far from everything. Um, it was very underdeveloped. Pittsburgh was just a mire uh, at that point. Um, but when the tax collector came by, uh, there started to be lots of riots. Uh, there was tarring and feathering, and tarring and feathering is not a very nice thing. Uh, it looks very painful. <clears throat> uh, in 1791 is when essentially the excise tax was back, passed. Um, and then uh, from there, 1794 is when things kind of got nasty. Uh, Joseph Neville, his entire property was burned down. And that is when George Washington said, okay, let's get a militia out there. Um, they met at Braddock Field at one point to sign a peace treaty, and then just a couple months later, as rioting was happening in Pittsburgh, uh, George Washington sent the militia in, uh, and they all just dispersed. So it's kind of a quiet rebellion at that point. Uh, but now, I get the pleasure of paying excise taxes on every <laughs> gallon of whiskey. Um, I don't plan on any rebellions. Uh, it does serve a good purpose. Um, but after that, uh, uh, Essentially, whiskey just carried on. Uh, whiskey producers for years were just kind of big guys, and there was nothing new or cool. It was just, whiskey was just a drink. Um, you know, marketing wasn't a big thing back then either, so it was just basically a, a base product. Uh, a really brief uh, a barrel diversion. Uh, barrels are really fascinating. Uh, it's, it's especially fascinating uh, to the state of Missouri, uh, if, you, if you guys are familiar. It is one of the oldest patents, one of the oldest vessels uh, for centuries uh, that has been used to store liquids and solids and things like that. And that's because of its structural integrity. Uh, it also speaks to uh, basically the wood that is used itself. Um, most whiskey, uh, almost all whiskey, is aged in new white American oak barrels. American whiskeys are aged in char uh, barrels. Char is a relatively new thing. Uh, a long time ago, uh, basically, if you, if you had whiskey and you were transporting it, um, they would just put it into an uncharred barrel and it was just to transfer from one area to the other. Uh, the charring came as an accident, I, I believe. I don't have the exact dates on this because this is kind of just mired in, in theory. Uh, if someone does know it, I'd like to know. But uh, essentially, on a ship, caught fire, uh, charred some of the barrels, said, use it anyway, throw the whiskey in there, uh, let it sit, sit and forget it. Uh, after either a few months or a few years, you try it and you're like, wow, it's really dark really, really good. Uh, and that has essentially helped shape uh, what American whiskey and, and your palates are for whiskey as well. Um, just generationally, it, it goes way back. Um, what's really, really cool about barrels, though, um, 
So when I mentioned uh, American oak, right, there's a reason it's American oak. When you take a stave, so we've got a stave over there, but one individual piece of a wood, right, uh, that stave uh, is set next to another stave, next to another, next to another, next to another. Uh, then it's bound together. Uh, then it's hydrated. Uh, that can be done with steam, that can be done with water, but here's what's unique about oak and barrels. Um, they start to bind back together. They seal, they expand. Other woods don't do that. I can't make a hickory barrel that would just hold liquid like that. Um, so that's what's really cool about uh, the barrels themselves. Uh, and because of that, that structure and their biological structure, um, when you go through a temperature change, changes, they expand and they contract. Um, that allows whiskey to get further into the barrel uh, and then further out. So it, it's just pulling all that goodness out of the oak itself. So it's a truly unique product, um, truly unique way to make whiskey as well. Uh, the last thing I'll kind of mention about barrels and Missouri especially, um, uh, Missouri is the largest producer, uh, is home to the largest producer of, of barrels in the entire world, uh, largest cooperage in the world. Uh, just a few hours away, uh, in Lebanon, Missouri, <clears throat> that cooperage, um, well, it just kind of give you like context, right? Uh, you could be at an airport bar uh, in San Francisco and you could be drinking uh, like a, a scotch there, right? And you're just drinking a 12 year scotch uh, on McAllen, Johnny Walker, something like that. Um, there's a very high probability uh, that that scotch that you were drinking, that liquid that's in your glass, uh, sat in a used Jim Beam barrel uh, over in Scotland, uh, and that Jim Beam barrel was made just a couple hours away from here. Like that is the impact that Missouri Wood has, and Missouri Barrels has on the entire whiskey universe that you know we understand. Um, I love sharing that. It's a it's a really it's a it's a really cool uh, piece of information. <clears throat> so enough about barrels. Uh, let's get down to the bottoms. Uh, a lot of these are just pictures because I just. I'm, I'm trying to paint a picture of, of what the spirit of the West Bottom is because it's not. This isn't a true timeline uh, of what's happened. It's, it's really more of a question of what makes this area special. Um, following the Whisker Rebellion, obviously there was stuff going on uh, in the in that area of Kansas City, and I'll just call it land at that point. Uh, the confluence of the Missouri and Kansas River uh, is kind of a, a natural meeting point. If you think about special places in that quote that I mentioned earlier. Uh, that is special. When you have two large, large bodies of water that feed into the largest body, uh, a moving body of water that runs the United States, um, there's a lot going on. Uh, we had fur traders that were coming through here, um, setting up posts and camps and, and basically doing all, all the work that needed to be done uh, to survive back then or to get goods to the east. Everything was about basically getting goods to the east um, from the West Bottoms at that point. <clears throat> Uh, it was around the, uh, let me get my notes here. Yes, it was around the 1870s uh, when the train line started uh, coming through. And if you're not, the Transcontinental Railroad, uh, where basically we connected the entire country, east to west, uh, post Civil War, uh, was really, really pivotal. Uh, at that point, that means that we could get goods from either the west to the east or um, really from the west bottoms, um, from the Midwest to the east. Uh, that allowed basically cattle drivers to take their cattle up to, you know, uh, Salina, Topeka, and they, they would then ship their cattle up to Kansas City uh, in the West Bottoms, where all that meat packing and stockyards, you know, really, really happened. Um, it's, it's incredible. I mean, I, I could share pictures and pictures and pictures. All of this kind of paints a beautiful picture of all that was going on. Um, all the cows. I mean, I'm sure the population was more cows uh, and, and gave it to people. Uh, I'm sure it smelled pretty amazing. Uh, back then. Um, but all that started happening in the 1870s, uh, and, and, and you know, as, as Tom alluded to, that is you know kind of where industry happened. That is Kansas City's roots. That is the, the commerce. Um, that is was the focus of Kansas City for a very very long time. Uh, and then with the 1880s to the 1920s uh, is when you started to see kind of a big explosion uh, of industry in the West Bottoms itself. Uh, and by industry, I mean just buildings. Um, these maps are incredible. Uh, this, I think, is, this is the 9th Street Incline, which uh, used to run basically from 9th Street down uh, into the West Bottoms. The original uh, Union Station, the Union Depot. Talking about the 1880s and 1920s, I always refer to it as the pre-prohibition era. Um, prohibition happened in America for a reason, and I'll get to that here in a second. But during that time frame, there was there was quite a bit going on. Uh, if you think about all of this industry, all of these buildings being built up. Um, 
there was a ton of innovation going on. Uh, people were creating new products, which I'll, I'll get to here in a second. Uh, but people were also very crazy. Uh, there was a lot of drinking back then, uh, a lot of seances, a lot of opium, uh, but even more so, uh, <coughs> drinking. Um, in fact, uh, Jay Reeder uh, and co, um, our counterpart uh, to the east, um, is great. They were founded in 1887. Uh, in the West Bottoms before uh, Prohibition, where they were uh, forced to shut down. Uh, they did a pre-Prohibition style whiskey, uh, which we both offer now, Kansas City Whiskey. There's three of them out there now. Um, that style uh, is basically uh, a, a blend of whiskey or whiskeys uh, that has up to two and a half percent of a fortified wine added to it. To understand that time period kind of shaped the framing uh, for all the people that were kind of drinking this stuff back then. Um, because all the drinking was happening, uh, the aged whiskey supply was dwindling very quickly. So in order to basically combat that, you were allowed to add a little bit of sherry to it, and that gives flavor and color uh, to what were otherwise, you know, pretty young whiskeys um, back then. <clears throat> um, and you'll get to try basically a little bit of an example of that here in a bit. So with all that innovation going on, um, there was a ton of people. Uh, a ton of people means a ton of drama. Uh, and as uh, Tom and Jerry mentioned earlier, uh, the wettest block in the United States uh, was the designation. Uh, that uh, party last night was fantastic. I had a lot of fun. Still a little foggy. But, okay. <laughs> uh, but it was. Uh, if you can imagine, uh, when I mentioned Prohibition as well, uh, Prohibition happened for a reason. Kansas as a state went into Prohibition before the entire country did. So uh, when that five o'clock whistle blows, you step over this imaginary line and it was just bar, 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 bar. Uh, and this is a little bit of a map that kind of shows. It was uh, uh, 24 saloons um, that were just right there. There's some great articles uh, that kind of talk about it as well. And that is really just to uh, keep all of those people uh, basically satiated and wet at that time <clears throat> during a difficult period for Kansas. Uh, this is a great article from the Kansas City Star. What the police commissioners commissioners uh, said when asked about the wettest block, L.A. H. Jones, a member of the Board of Police Commissioners, was asked this morning if the police board contemplated any action in regard to the wettest block at 9th Street and State Line. Mr. Jones replied by asking a question, which would be better, to have plenty of saloons or only two or three with men fighting to get in or standing in line. Uh, there was debate. People really wanted to drink uh, back then. Um, that kind of is a good example or a good representation of you know, what I was describing of, of like people were just drinking. Uh, you, you worked and you drank. Uh, that was your life. Uh, there's another article. Um, it had been a. It had been many hours since Saturday night cleaning, and the stroke of midnight. Sunday would proclaim the, that the lid was off. So basically, they're saying, all right, we're, we're, getting, we're basically at, at midnight or at 12 o'clock. You can drink again. Uh, it was raining hard, water, water everywhere, but nothing else to drink until so, so 12 o'clock. Probably at that hour, the wet o'clock in Casey was open for business. And it's 24 saloons. Uh, 24 saloons is quite a bit. Um, that's a lot. We don't even really see that, you know, here. Like, we've got our entertainment districts here in Kansas City. Um, we've got a power line. There's, there's always just, you know, unique, unique stuff to do. You never saw. You don't really see blocks like this anymore. That it was just dedicated to just kind of getting after it um, when it came to, <laughs> came to drinking. Um, all that drinking is kind of, you know, it's fun. Uh, there's, there's sin. There's debauchery. There's stories past. There's bad things, uh, a lot of bad things that go along with that. Uh, but ultimately, um, a lot of energy was going into the West Bottom at that point. Um, a, lot was, a lot was being done. Um, the people that I kind of want to call out, because I think they're pretty unique to the West Bottoms and, and, and just Kansas City in general. Uh, the lovely lady on the left is Annie Chambers. Um, if you're not familiar with Annie Chambers, uh, she was a, essentially a brothel owner. Um, <coughs> she came here west uh, in 1869, the same year the Hannibal Bridge of, uh, opened a small rail route across the Missouri River to Kansas City. Uh, the town was bustling with new arrivals, livestock traders, railroad men, farmers, merchants, uh, many of whom were big spenders. Uh, Chambers found her trade in the world's famous profession, uh, she was a prostitute, uh, so lucrative that she was able to open her own bordello uh, with 25 rooms um, that was sitting at the corner of Third and wind up. Um, if you drive by it, there's a beautiful building there now. It's not Bordello, um, which is great. Uh, she's fascinating, though. Um, you know, aside from you know having the world's oldest profession and, and then you know making a lot of money off of it um, back in the day, uh, she eventually kind of saw the light. She found she found God in that at, 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 her, at an older age. 
Uh, but she talked about how hard it was for women back then. Um, women would come to her and she would not want to hire them, um, but the only option they had was, uh, as a quote, um, uh, poison or the river. Like, that's what they had. Um, she used all of her funds that she made to actually open a shelter for women in her later life, uh, was able to do a lot of good uh, that way. Um, we, we have a secret menu item uh, on our uh, cocktail parlor menu. Uh, well, it's not on the menu, it's a secret menu item. Uh, that'd be a, this kind of in honor of Annie, Annie Chambers. Um, the other person I couldn't find a good photo of him uh, was Stephen H. Dealey. Um, a lot of us, if you're familiar with the, the West Bottoms, you know, we all kind of know, you, know, you can kind of see on some of the old paintings and advertisements, uh, some of the things that were made down there. John Deere definitely had the manufacturing done down there. Um, Stephen H. Uh, Dealey uh, was the son-in-law of uh, basically John Deere himself. Um, so this is nepotism at its finest. <laughs> uh, he uh, eventually opened a um, manufacturing uh, down in the West Bottoms as well. Uh, he was a, a very, a very complex man. Uh, he was very um, striking. Uh, ultimately, though, he started a, a business making airplanes down in the West Bottoms, which I'll get to here in a second. Um, so all these people kind of revolved around West Bottoms, and I really wanted to talk about the 13th Street uh, kind of corridor there because a lot's going on. It kind of plays into you know what's going on there now. Uh, 1321 uh, West 13th Street is the Oliver Building. It was built in 1893. Um, it was the Oliver Tractor Company, essentially. Uh, and if you uh, really think about it back then, if you really put yourself back in the 1890s with all that craziness, tractors were brand new technology. Um, tractors were brand spanking new technology. That was innovation at its finest. And it was being developed right, if I push the button right here, think, nope, let me go back. Um, right here, 1321, I'll point out the train, uh, train tunnel there. Trains were pretty much integrated into all the buildings. You can't really tell now, like some of the buildings you can kind of see, but trains were essentially integrated into all the buildings down here, uh, which is really, really neat. Um, that was super innovative at the time as well. Um, what's really cool is uh, 1321, Oliver Tractor Company, you've got going on there. Uh, 1311 uh, is the Quincy Building that was built by John Quincy Adams' grandson, which is kind of a, a nice little factoid. I haven't dug much into it. I'm probably going to talk to Jeremy after this, uh, but I think. Uh, the Quincy's uh, had uh, quite a bit to do with Kansas City history, whether we realize it or not. Um, but John Deere had manufacturing there in the Quincy building. So right next to, to uh, the Oliver tractor, John Deere was making stuff, but John Deere wasn't making tractors yet. Um, John Deere was still making the leather goods that all the rural farmers required. It was gonna take a long time for every farmer to have a tractor in their life at some point. Um, so you still had all these tannery goods that needed to be basically made for all the farmers at that, that time period. Um, which makes it kind of a, a unique space. Uh, it, it's a new transition point that was really, really kind of happening in America. <clears throat> um, there's fires and floods. Uh, and when I, it, that's kind of a general statement I make about the West Bottoms a lot. They were just fires and floods, fires and floods. I love this picture because it really kind of calls out uh, basically the 1321 and 1311 there in the corner. You can see where the trains you know, came through the building Floods obviously had massive, massive impact uh, on the business in fact then. Um, very bad, uh, in particular the 51. Uh, the flood of 1951, if, if you're not familiar, there was, it was just flood, flood, flood. Um, 1993 was bad, that one I do remember. Um, <clears throat> but 1951 was kind of the death knell for the West Bottoms. Uh, if you think about it, um, not a lot happened after that one. Uh, we used to have a cocktail on the menu called the 51 flood um, in honor of that. Um, but yeah, essentially there, there was a lot going on. Thankfully now we don't see a lot of uh, floods quite like that anymore. Um, thanks to the Army Corps of Reserve who constantly dredges that river, um, which is really nice. Um, over the years, uh, obviously 1321 and 1311, uh, West 13th Street have gone through a number of different changes. Uh, Veeley, uh, back to Stephen H. Veeley, um, uh, eventually uh, John Deere made tractors. They, uh, they bought it out of Waterloo, Iowa. Um, and basically turned that into their tractor company. Um, but in 1311, uh, which I think is really, really fascinating, uh, was the manufacturing of airplanes. Uh, this is the, the monocoupe. So as a, as a, they were uh, the Vili Saddlery Company, uh, Motor Company, uh, and eventually they developed something called the monocoupe. Uh, that was the first commercially available to buy uh, airplane in the United States. Um, and it was made on the second floor of the 1311. So you can actually see the frame assembly that was happening. 
Uh, you can see the engine assembly that was happening there, uh, which is pretty fascinating. So if, you know, 1920s, 30s, uh, if you had enough money and you wanted to buy a plane, you could just do it. Um, I love these pictures too because when you, it just kind of gives you scope and scale of what was being built back then. Uh, this is more or less a, just a lawnmower engine now, uh, but people were brave enough to go up in those planes, um, which I think was pretty cool. <clears throat> Uh, and then over the years, uh, those two buildings, those two locations have changed. Uh, there have been anything, uh, a lot of these ads were really cool to, to find and, and look over. Uh, sales salespeople <clears throat> for John Deere, uh, waste paper, some of these are far back as 1907, 1945, uh, 1975 uh, for just erection company. Uh, they, they, there was just stuff everywhere going on um, down there. Nothing really sticking, essentially. It's just warehouse space um, until... Uh, a lot of event space as well, uh, until uh, back in 2019, uh, as I had uh, basically put together a business plan, put all of my money uh, into what I thought would be a really, really cool uh, distillery. I always knew I wanted to do it in the West Bottoms because of kind of all these reasons that I've listed. It's a very uh, unique space. Uh, so I found uh, on Craigslist, not in that newspaper ad, but on Craigslist, uh, and yes, it's used for non-nefarious things, uh, I found this uh, train tunnel. Uh, so 1321 West 13th Street um, is where I, I basically found this, this train tunnel. It's, uh, it's exactly 13 foot wide. It's, it's 40 foot deep. Uh, I could afford it, um, which was great. Uh, but I, I thought I could, I could turn this into a distillery. I, could, I can shape this into uh, something to launch into something bigger uh, at some point. Uh, and so we uh, opened our doors in uh, January of 2021, which is, uh, which is great. It was the middle of COVID, so it was fun for everybody. <laughs> Um, and we launched with our Kansas City whiskey, which is a, a pre-prohibition um, style of whiskey. Have any of you been uh, down to our space before? Oh, some have, yeah. Bruce definitely has. Um, <clears throat> uh, I love it. I, I think it's really unique. Um, our whiskeys, uh, a, a big goal of our whiskeys is to be innovative. Uh, our tagline is innovative American whiskeys. Uh, and that is because we want to explain the history of whiskey, but also introduce uh, new flavors and, and new techniques that are kind of going on. Um, right now, that is a that is a 211 gallon copper Olympic pot still um, from Portugal, uh, hand hammered. Uh, her name is Hestia. Hestia is a Greek goddess known for a particular scar. Uh, when she came over from Portugal, she had a huge dent in the side of the onion, um, which was a little heartbreaking. Uh, I think Cass cried, uh, but I, I did too a little bit. Uh, but ultimately, what you do is uh, it's hand hammered. So you took a hammer, hammered it back into place. Uh, but now she's got a beautiful scar on the side of her face, and I just tell people that just adds to the flavor. Um, the whiskeys that we make right now, uh, it, it is a combination of sourcing and uh, distillation and aging. If you're not familiar with sourcing, um, sourcing is where you buy whiskey aged already. Uh, it just depends on what you do with it. Um, I didn't want to buy a whiskey and just put a label on it and say it was, you know, and proof it down to whatever and just say, hey, that's our whiskey. I wanted to create a unique blend, and that's what that Kansas City whiskey is that you'll try here in a minute. Um, we are working on a single malt whiskey, uh, our space itself. So uh, after, after we were in that train tunnel for a year and a half, we were able to expand into 1311. Um, that train tunnel in particular is really, really special. Um, when I talk about that transition and change, I really believe that that train tunnel is a snapshot of transition and change. If you've got tractors being manufactured right here and you've got leather goods being manufactured right here, um, it creates a, 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 really cool, a really cool feel. Uh, for that space. Um, and if you haven't been down there, uh, we still have the original metal ceilings because uh, you didn't want to catch the second floor on fire. Uh, there's a bumper along the wall. Uh, and to me, the brickwork is what's really fascinating. Um, you can see where things were recently bricked up. Uh, in our walls, you can see uh, where there were doorways. Um, and in one wall in particular, you can see where the chain actually stopped and just chugged and chugged steam and just eroded that brick uh, over time. So it's a very, very unique space um, when it comes to that. Here's another picture this as well. Um, that, uh, that is the entrance, that far picture, that is the entrance to our, our distillery now. Um, those barrel doors are really cool. I found them on the sixth floor of the Oliver building. Uh, no one knows where they came from. Uh, and that stained glass, it says, it actually, it's got a, it's a beautiful crest. It's kind of a crown jewel of the distillery. Um, it says distillery on it. Uh, I found it. <laughs> I found it at one of the antique stores uh, down there in the West Bottoms, which is really fascinating. Um, it did take me like three months to get them down on price. So if you're ever, <laughs> they'll haggle with you, trust me. You'll, you'll get to something at some point if you really want it. Uh, and I, I highly encourage you to do that as well. Um, but yeah, a, a lot of this was meant to kind of like, uh, it started as a dream for me. 
uh, to open a distillery. It, it was my dream. I really, really wanted to, uh, to do that and to, to make a life out of it, um, you know, which I'm doing now. But it, it's really cool to see um, how that can kind of be a turning point for a neighborhood and kind of drive innovation. Um, we like to use what we've got. So we don't want to add. I'm not adding additional structures. Um, when we run out of space for barrels, my plan is to either use it on some of the other floors or get a shipping container and just put it outside right, right next door. Um, the goal for me was to really emphasize that, that era, that pre-prohibition era, which was so special, um, <clears throat> special back then. Uh, last thing I'll mention, uh, the Kansas City Whiskey. Uh, it is a pre-prohibition style of whiskey. Uh, the, some of the awards have already been uh, uh, mentioned. Uh, it is kind of a reflection of what whiskeys might have tasted uh, like back then. Uh, it is a blend of a bourbon and a rye uh, and a very dry sherry as well. Um, we have won a number of uh, different awards. Uh, the most recent was really cool. We were mentioned in Forbes.com as the top ranked American blended whiskey, um, which is really cool. And that is because we received a 99 point rating at the uh, Las Vegas Global Spirits Competition, which is really, really crazy, uh, really crazy to think. Um, us as a business and in our goal uh, as a distillery is, is to kind of share that history, um, share that spirit. Uh, our figurehead is uh, Murdoch. You can see him. He's kind of a striking gentleman. He's the embodiment of everything I loved about the West Bottoms. Um, if you think about that time period in particular, uh, new technology meant new innovation. New innovation meant that, you know, essentially uh, working men were able to create and to change things and to build a life for their family and to develop ways to do things differently. Um, and that's what I loved about that time period, and I think that was really encouraging. Uh, for, for me to be alive in that time period, if someone had said there's going to be a city in the sky, you would have believed it back then. Uh, and I do think, as, as, as crazy as times have been for us and as, as much as they change, I do think that we are living in a very innovative time. Uh, it's a very exciting time to be alive um, with a lot of the innovation going on with space travel and things like that. So I think it's very important to kind of harken back to where that is. Uh, and to the point about the development of the West Bottoms. Um, it does feel like we're getting back to our roots uh, as a city, and I really, really love that, um, knowing that that's where our founders and uh, the original people who, who, you know, the reason we're here today, um, those travelers, those explorers, <clears throat> those traders, uh, really founded Kansas City, and it's really nice to see a lot more attention going back into the neighborhood, uh, because I think it's special, and I think a lot of other people think it's special, too. Um, but with that, uh, that is, uh, oh, I, I do a few sources I want to call out real quick. Um, all of these uh, were great. I, I got a lot of information online. I did get some help, uh, some great help from a friend of mine. His name is Joe from uh, Casey Yesterday. So if you are not familiar with that, I asked for, I'm not, I'm not a researcher. <clears throat> um, so I definitely need a little bit of help finding some of these, uh, some of these details. Uh, definitely check him out. It's a great blog. Uh, he does some really, really inter interesting history tidbits around Kansas City. Um, but with that, yeah, uh, I'm opening up uh, for questions. I'm sorry for, for uh, stealing the mic real quick, but I, I wanted to, first of all, uh, thank Alex and... Um, we're lucky to have you and oh, Cassandra you. and your beautiful daughter um, here in town. I mean, just the, the passion you have for uh, not only, you know, what's going to make us better going forward, but balancing that with the legacy of how we got to where we are right now. That's pretty unique. And, and well, I want to give you a, a round of applause. Thank that. you. Appreciate that. Thanks, Tom. Um, but I mainly wanted to jump up here before Jeremy came up because... I want to just reinforce how lucky we are to have an institution like the Kansas City Public Library. Um, I don't know how much you all realize the, um, the regard throughout the country um, that is given for the, the role that our Kansas City Public Library has in celebrating our historical legacy, but also in, in doing things that matter for informing the public. Um, you know, my, I run a nonprofit called PCs for People. We, refurbished, donated computers, we build Wi-Fi networks, all for low-income communities. It, it's an area called digital inclusion, digital equity. Um, no city in the country has an anchor institution like the Kansas City Public Library for representing digital equity and digital inclusion. Because everything anymore, you have to be able to be 
digitally literate to get uh, access to information. And so Jeremy and his colleagues here at the library are true champions of that. And bringing a program like this and having a topic like this, Alex, where we can celebrate all the maybe seedy aspects of the history, but at the same time, it's just what makes us human beings. I mean, um, it helped me appreciate the fact that we drink whiskey because, you know, a lot of farmers, they had to do it to survive. They were just being rational. They were being smart. I do have a question, though, uh, after all that. First of all, thank you all for being here, and thank you again, Alex. I, I want to start off with the questions, though. Yes. I grew up in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, my mom still lives there. My older brother runs something called Mint Julep Tours. Oh, very And nice. people come from all over the world to see... Uh, bourbon distilleries in Kentucky. And I know you manufacture a bourbon whiskey here. You talked a little bit about barrels. What can you tell us about bourbon as opposed to whiskey in general? Yeah, um, let me get this, this moniker right. Um, uh, all bourbon is whiskey, but not all whiskey is bourbon. Uh, bourbon as a classification of a whiskey has to be at least 51% corn uh, and aged for at least two years in new charred oak, uh, American oak barrels. Uh, and that just means it's, it's only been used, that barrel's only been used, or that, that it's a first use barrel, essentially. Uh, it is a very uniquely American spirit, by the way. Um, when you talk about types of whiskeys and classifications of whiskeys, um, bourbon, uh, and Kentucky straight bourbon, for instance, is a, a very specific. Uh, that, that time period, um, the designation of char barrel, all of that, uh, the designation of corn, too. It is a very uniquely American spirit. Most whiskeys around the world are not, have no corn, uh, like in terms of volume. Um, so we as Americans, are, that we love that. We love that sweetness. Uh, there's a nice ethanol to it um, that comes off, and it, it mixes really well when you add caramelization and vanilla from barrels and things like that. Um, other whiskeys, though, um, like uh, other whiskeys are essentially just grain that, grain-based distillate that has touched a barrel, essentially. That, that, is, that is a whiskey. Um, we have a uh, rye whiskey that is coming out here pretty soon uh, that was finished uh, in, well, it, it's a rye, very high rye whiskey that was finished in uh, maple, maple syrup barrels, um, but those barrels are kind of cool because they started off as Whistle Pig 10-year barrels, and then they had run amuck maple syrup in them in Vermont, and then they traveled all the way down here to Kansas City. Um, they looked like they were going to fall apart, so I thought I had made a very bad purchase. <laughs> but uh, to that point about rehydrating it, I actually took uh, uh, Cassandra's um, clothes steamer, uh, broke it, uh, <laughs> steamed the barrel, um, and after steaming it for a while, uh, it, they became very, very sticky. I threw that rye whiskey in there, uh, com comes out. Uh, so to answer your question, though, um, bourbon is uniquely American because of the corn and the new, new barrel and the age requirement for it. <clears throat> Yeah, other questions? How's it going? Good. I want to compliment you on your old time beard. Oh, thank you. I, uh, maybe someday I'll get to your level. Uh, <laughs> uh, then a bit of history. You spoke about the Hayes Rebellion. Uh, that was actually the last time uh, an American commander in chief led an army. I did read that somewhere. That, that is fascinating. Yeah, uh, George Washington literally went to go take care of business. Um, exactly right. And that was the last time? Yes. That's a, that's, see, that's fascinating. Yeah. People get really up in arms about whiskey and taxes. Uh, <laughs> they really do. <clears throat> uh, and then I, I guess a whiskey question. Uh, are you able to source uh, your grain, your ingredients here locally? Do you have farms that you contract with? As much as possible, yeah. And there's channels for doing that. Um, there's... Uh, there's milling companies that are popping up. Uh, it's a really cool part of the industry. Um, depend, it's depending on what, what kind of whiskey you want to make. Um, uh, the single malt that we showed earlier, that single malt, for instance, um, it's, it's two-row barley and it's peated malt. Uh, peated malt is what makes um, scotch, scotch, um, what's, what's kind of interesting because of the malting process itself. I try to get as much local grain as I can for that. Peated malt is not a local product, but uh, it is... It, it, it is going, I think it's going to be pretty good. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot of local suppliers, and I try to get uh, through this as much as possible. I don't have any connections directly with farmers yet, um, but at some point when we're really cooking and we're really distilling a lot more, uh, I'm hoping to get that done. I, one thing to note, are you guys familiar with what malting is? 
Um, so this is a big this is a big part when you see malt whiskey or malt this or malt that. Um, malting is a process you do with the grain itself. Um, malting is essentially where, uh, and it's a very grim fairy tale way of telling this, um, but if you think barley, for instance, uh, barley, um, barley is out in the field. It is harvested. You collect all of that grain. Uh, you take all of that barley and you throw it onto a malting floor, big floor like this. Uh, you create this very beautiful nursery environment for them. So all these seeds are like, oh, all right, I'm, I'm going to become more barley and I'm going to create more barley. Um, so they get bigger. These grains get bigger and bigger and bigger uh, to the point where they sprout. And they're like, here I go. I'm going to be a barley stock. And they turn on a big oven. They just bake the hell out of it, uh, shake the sprouts off. Um, but what that process did is uh, that imparted a lot more sugars and proteins into that grain. More sugar means more alcohol. Um, the, what makes it unique, uh, uh, scotch unique, is um, you know, we in the United States have an abundance of natural resources. Uh, we could cook that oven all day. We could burn all that wood, uh, do that malting process however you need to do it. Uh, over in Scotland, in Ireland, for instance, not as much. They're on an island. Uh, so what do you use to burn? Uh, with the ground around you, peat moss. Um, and that peat moss, when it, they do that, uh, that basically stop that germination process by heating it up, um, that peat moss is imparting all of that flavor uh, into that grain itself. So when you drink a scotch, that's why a scotch tastes so much different than a bourbon or uh, a rye whiskey, for instance. <clears throat> Let me hold a sec. I got, got that way further out than I wanted it to. Uh, potentially um, sinful question. You've got this absolutely incredible whiskey that you've brought with you. What would be your go-to cocktail to make with that whiskey? Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. Yeah, I, I haven't done a, a big salesman job yet um, with the whiskey yet. Uh, the old fashioned. Um, we, uh, we, we got voted the best old fashioned uh, in Kansas City uh, back in 2021 when we opened, which is really cool because people always come into that train tunnel and they're like, oh, I'll be the judge of that. Um, but it is really, really good. Uh, it's great and old fashioned. Uh, that whiskey is, is, is a little bit more rye heavy, so you get a lot of spice, but there's a lot of characters with spice. Um, and it works really well with a maple syrup, uh, two dashes of Angus stir bitters, one drop of chocolate bitters. That's the recipe. Um, <clears throat> but it's good. Uh, and the goal with that whiskey was to make it work in every cocktail. So um, our, our train tunnel parlor distillery, uh, by the way, <clears throat> I'll mention uh, we are open Tuesdays, Tuesdays and Wednesdays, 11 a.m. to 4 p.m., uh, Thursdays, 11 a.m. to 10 p.m., and Fridays and Saturdays, 11 a.m. to midnight. Um, we didn't just want to open a, a distillery with a tasting room that was just sample, sample, t-shirt, bottle, buy. We wanted people to experience the West Bottoms and, and to experience our whiskey and cocktails, uh, especially if we've got one really good whiskey. How do you express that in different ways, and, and especially to people who don't drink whiskey, um, and as, as through cocktails? Um, so yeah, great question. Thank you for the, the, the high five on that one. <clears throat> One back here. So oh. what, when you say what happens, it's short. Oh, oh no, you're good. Yeah, but for you two, you have to speak into the mic. I'll, I'll repeat the question, yeah. What a stone finish uh, on one of your whiskeys. A stone finish? Yeah, stone fruit. Oh, stone fruit. Yes, yes. Oh, yeah, on the, on the, on the finish, the, the taste description. Yeah, stone fruit is like um, apricots, uh, uh, plums, I get plum a lot of time. Uh, you can sometimes get green apple. Um, that comes a lot from uh, the sherry and the rye. The combination of those two together are really fascinating. Um, so it creates kind of this stone fruit finish. Um, it's a really good sipping whiskey. Uh, the, the goal of that whiskey was to create a day-to-day -day drinker for people. I wanted to hit that price point, proof point, flavor point. Um, and when you have a sip, well, you guys will have a sip here in a second, but I, I always like the spice that you get up front. It's heavy on the rye. Uh, and that second sip kind of gives you that, that stone fruit finish on the back end, which I like. <clears throat> I'm very concerned about keeping those old buildings. Um, I hear a lot of rumors about um, developers wanting to tear them down and put up apartments and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I love what you all done with your location, put innovation in you know, the original location and keep it pretty much the same, but is there, you know, an initiative to any new people to come down there, to, you know, businesses to try and get them to keep the buildings the way they are? I think, um, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, there is development happening down there. Uh, I, I've talked with them. It did make sense for me, uh, mostly financially. Uh, to, to make a, a move like that to uh, some of those. Uh, the development, I think, is overall is going to be really 
good. And when I say development, it's not tearing buildings down. There is one building in particular that is going to be going. It's, I think it's the Weld Wheel uh, building. Uh, it just got city approval to uh, be taken down. Um, there's good reason for it. Um, it is an old building. It was built in 1910, but like, it's, uh, it's, it's a little bit of an eyesore. It's also very close to the train track. Um, for the most part, though, what you're hearing, that development um, that's happening down there, uh, there is going to be, yeah, new apartments. Um, everything that I've, I've seen so far is, um, I think it's going to be more renovation of current structure than it is new. Uh, the, obviously, the, the landscape of the West Bottoms will change a little bit, but I don't think it's going to change like people are really uh, frightened of or concerned uh, about. Um, and I've met with them, and, and uh, the, they, I, I, I believe that they are going to do a good job with the buildings that are there. I do know, uh, I think one of the old haunted houses um, is going to become a boutique hotel at some point, which would be incredible. Uh, I want to stay there um, after they get the development done, but yeah. <clears throat> Like someone on the stream who's watching online had question about uh, taxes. Uh, what I assume they mean just maybe taxes from the distiller's perspective as opposed to the consumer's perspective. Do you have any oh yeah, information uh, about that? yeah. So I yeah. I mean, obviously, um, you as a consumer, when you buy whiskey, you're paying a retail uh, uh, sales tax, basically. Uh, us uh, as a producer of whiskey. Um, back to 1791, uh, any, any proof gallon of whiskey, and a, a proof gallon of whiskey is basically how much al alcohol is in there at 100 proof. Uh, for every proof gallon of whiskey, you have to pay a certain amount of, of money to the government. And that's a, that's a monthly filing you have to do, and that's a quarterly payment depending on what size of a distillery you are. Um, there is a federal uh, excise tax that you pay, uh, and then there is a state excise tax that you pay uh, as well for every proof gallon. Um, uh, federally, it's, it's a lot less than it used to be. Um, state, in terms of states, each state gets to determine what their excise state uh, tax is. Uh, this is also really cool about Missouri because I believe it is the lowest of any state, um, which kind of explains you know, why there are so many distilleries uh, in the state of Missouri. I, didn't, I had the map up here and I didn't even talk about it. Um, so if you're familiar with the Kentucky Bourbon Trail, there is the Missouri Spirits Expedition. Um, it is a map. I've got them up there too. Um, in terms of distillery, like every state has distilleries, there's craft distilleries all over the East Coast and the West Coast. Uh, Missouri is very unique. Um, if you think about uh, all the states that touch Missouri, and there's a lot, um, there's like 15 distilleries, 20 in one state, 40 in Illinois. Uh, Missouri has almost 70 distilleries in it, by far the most in the Midwest. Uh, and 40 of those are on this map. Uh, I am uh, the vice president on the Missouri Craft Distillers Guild this year. Um, Ryan Maybe over at Rieger is the president, so that bodes really well for Kansas City. Um, but there's a lot of great spirits being made uh, across the state, uh, and I highly encourage you guys to visit them. Um, there's a whole stamp. There's discounts. Uh, you can become uh, an enthusiast member as well, um, and that kind of allows you to yeah, basically experience all, that, all, all the distilleries in the West Bottoms. I'd love to do a partnership with, with, with one of them at some point. Um, we are the furthest west distillery in the state. Uh, I want to talk to the furthest east and see if we can maybe send a barrel down the river at some point uh, and do a swab. <clears throat> yep. Bruce? When can we get a sip? When can you get a sip? Are you ready for a sip? Any other questions? All right, one, one more question. So when you're developing your whiskeys, do you have like a small R&D still? Yeah. And then yeah. kind of related to that, how many iterations did you have to go through before you ended up with some, you said, yep, this is the one? Yeah, um, uh, I have a small still. So for the whiskeys that, that I distilled, the single malt that's coming out really soon, uh, that, that is one that, you know, basically tried it on, a, on my small still. Uh, I've got a 10-gallon a version that I started on. His name is Hephaestus, Greek god of fire and metal. Um, yeah, definitely do, do that process as well. Um, when it came to that, though, because it's sourced, right, so that's where you basically buy the whiskey aged already, but I, I wanted to do a blend. Uh, so I had a bunch of samples sent to me, um, and then I tried to basically put it together. Cass and I sat down uh, and spent very, three very, very, very drunk nights uh, and three very hard mornings coming up uh, with a blend, but it ultimately came down to just uh, these two whiskeys that worked really well together in a sherry, a very dry sherry. Um, that worked really well with those, those two whiskeys. Uh, that process, 
uh, coming up with a, <clears throat> a blend was a very intense process. Uh, it's very different than, you know, dist distilling and aging a whiskey and then letting it sit. Uh, when it comes to that kind of development of a product, uh, that, is, uh, that is going up to the barrels and saying, not ready, not ready, ready. Um, or maybe you wait too long, you're like, I wish I would have taken it out sooner. Um, but yeah, yeah, very good question. Thank you guys, I truly appreciate it. Uh, so if you want, um, Cass is pouring some samples. Uh, come on over, we'll, we'll chat. I've got these maps here too. Um, yeah, thank you all so much. <clears throat>